a good time for us to get started. Um, I'm curious, who is eating pairings? Because we haven't really pushed that focus, but I, I think we talked about it last time before we all popped off. I'd love to go kind of round robin style and see what, I, what everyone chose to pair. Mike, I'll start with you. You're on mute. Proud to show this ornate charcuterie plate. <laughs> Just, it's actually really high quality uh, salumi here, like, uh, and it's quite good. This is like the saltiness of this with both with both the Madeiras is tremendous. Like, I actually am almost preferring the sweeter one with this because it's just that counterpoint is lovely. I'm very happy with this pairing. Yum, Kim. I saw you nod your head. What are you What are you eating? Oh no, I have nothing. I just have chicken. But I have dessert for later that I'm going to try and pair with it. So, nice. well, depending on how your chicken is, the surcial might work. I wouldn't do the boil. I'd save that for something a little richer, but yeah. Yeah. Allison, what about you? What are you snacking on? So, I made your pasta dish, although um, with the shrimp, but like I said, I don't have the pretty shells on top. So, it has, I used the, um, the um, surcial in it. I haven't tasted it yet, um, <laughs> but I use the surcial and I am going to make, I found a recipe for sauteed mushrooms using Madeira and I plan to use the boal in that one when I make it later, but I also got this beautiful cheese at Italy yesterday that is, hold on, I'll tell you the name. It is, uh, uh, I gotta find the wrapper. It is, and find the, the name, uh, Castel Rosso. And it's a cow's milk cheese. And I thought that it would be good because it's going to be, it's, it's a little bit aromatic, but it's going to be richer, but not be a hard cheese. It's going to soften as it warms up, which I thought could texture wise go well, but we'll see. Awesome. Marcy, what about you? Are you snacking on anything? We had a huge court filing today. So I actually was ready to pass out and had to eat at about 4.30. <laughs> so I'm sort of done. And I, and I had some of this wine last night in one of my tiny glasses. And I can't remember what I ate. <laughs> <laughs> it's been one of those weeks for me too, Marcy. I feel you. At least you've got the good wine now. Natalie, what about you? What are you snacking on, if any? Um, we just have some cheese. Uh, what is it? Sharp, sharp cheddar. Sharp cheddar. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Let us know as we go through this which, uh, which wine you prefer with your sharp cheddar. I'd love to know. What can I do? Um, I don't normally eat while I'm doing these things, but I couldn't resist with Madeira. No, I think today's it's it's like the last day of school, you know, like there's no dress code, there's no formality, like this one's more fun. I mean, they're always fun, but we can all eat. I'm going to actually, when Allison starts talking, I'm going to go grab some cheese for myself too. Yeah. And I'll tell you a funny story. And not funny. Katie and Kevin, are you snacking on anything? We are, but it's not a pairing, unfortunately. We're living on vacation tomorrow, so we're just ordered, ordered in tonight, so we didn't want to cook. Nice. That's the only reason. Well, let us know if there's anything that like happens to be magical as you're snacking or oh, as you're eating. What'd you order in? Sushi, something we knew we wouldn't have leftovers no, for. The surcial could work quite well with um, maybe a tuna or something. Yeah, okay, perfect. Cool. And Sharon, last but not least, only if you're around and wanting to come on, we're talking about um, if we have any food in front of us. Um, but if you wanna pop on later, we can hit, hit back at ya. Um, yeah, I don't think she's on yet, but that's okay. So we're all on, you guys. Welcome to uh, Portugal or Madeira more specifically. Um, of course, we've got our lovely partner, Mike, back. He was gone the last couple of weeks. Um, although, so Mike is back. Allison and I are gonna be doing the majority of the instruction this time. Um, but of course, Mike always has great insights. So please feel free to chime in whenever you would like, if you would like. Um, tonight, we all have our wine in front of us. There's two Madeiras. We're gonna be doing a dry Madeira first, which is the Blandy's five-year Circeal. 
which is this guy right here, and then the sweeter one, which is the five-year ball. Um, I'm curious, has anyone been to Portugal? Raise your hands. Okay. And so of Marcy and Allison, have you been to Madeira? Okay, so Allison is classically, as she always is, our amazing tour guide for this evening. Um, I have some fun pictures to share as she's chatting. Um, but uh, we are just really excited to kind of wrap up this island wine tasting series. We've got more information on our next series after all this fun information. Um, if I know Allison and uh, Marcy has some stories, but um, please, Mike, at the end, I will prompt us back for story time. I'd love to hear about your experience with tasting your 1908 Madeira. Um, so don't forget, this is my reminder to you. And um, I have you beat. I've had an 1842. <laughs> you can tell that story too. Yes, but did you have the three Michelin star pairing with it? No, but I was in Madeira and, and had like from the 1800s. It's just extraordinary that. All right, we have to compare notes. <laughs> Um, so before I hop in with my fun facts, I'd say let's uh, cheers to many things. Um, cheers in Portuguese is felicidades. Um, so let's all cheers together. Felicidades. felicidades. Happy Friday, everyone, and to Madeira. So some fun facts. Um, I'm keeping them quick and pretty not wine centric this time because I didn't want to step on Allison's fun uh, and on her toes because basically all of Madeira and its history is one huge fun fact. So um, I will let her take on the larger fun facts, but just to give you a little bit more information about the country itself or the, the island itself. Um, Madeira Island is very mountainous with peaks reaching over 6000 feet. And when it was uh, claimed in 1419, the island was covered with laurel forest. Laurel is a type of wood tree um, leading to its name. And Madeira means wood in Portuguese. Um, Madeira Island is actually closer to Africa than it is to Europe by hundreds of miles. Um, and I'll show you a map of how close that is when Allison gets to chatting. Um, the island has the world's largest fireworks display for New Year's Eve, and it even made it into the Guinness Book of World Records in 2006, which is kind of funny because the island is very sustainable, but fireworks are not very sustainable, but I digress. Um, I still love some fireworks. You just can't, <laughs> can't deny a good firework show, you know? That's okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, during the 1880s, immigrants from Madeira introduced the ukulele to the Hawaiian Islands. I thought that was really interesting because we think of Hawaii as, you know, or the ukulele in Hawaii as their instrument, but it was not. Uh, it was technically immigrated to the island. Um, and then finally, my one little wine fact about Madeira. Um, one, Madeira is one of Thomas Jeff, or was, he's not still here, was one of Thomas Jefferson's favorite wines. Madeira was used to toast the U.S. Declaration of Independence, and a bottle of Madeira was used to christen the USS Constitution in 1719. So we've got some good shit here tonight, you guys. Very, very excited um, <laughs> <laughs> to, to uh, follow up my informal, informalness of this evening. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Allison. She's going to be chatting about the island itself and the different grape varieties that we have. I'm gonna pop out really fast and get myself some cheese. So Allison, without further ado, please take it away. Great, I'm very excited to talk about Madeira because um, I've had the pleasure in the past to work with this region to do trade events for them. I've also worked with port when they've declared vintages. And when I first got into wine, of course, I tasted port like everyone else. So Ruby port was very appealing to a novice palate, not not to knock it, ruby ports are pretty extraordinary, but as a novice palate, it was super fruity and sweet, but it was very high in alcohol that you could taste. And then I tried tawny ports, which are aged in oak, and they take on a little more subdued, um, caramelized flavors. And I was like, oh, okay, I like tawny port because everybody talks about port. And then I had Madeira, and let me tell you, I love Madeira. And hopefully what you'll find enjoying it with the little food and tasting these 
and we have two styles and I'll talk about the different styles, the different grapes, that it goes with food. It's not just a dessert wine. It's not something you have to have at the end of a meal. You can have it all the way through. And the last time I worked with Madeira a few years ago, our whole thing was about food pairing. So we did food and wine seminars and showed how you can go with, and we'll talk more about food at the end, but nuts and dried fruits and cheeses, but you can also go with, you know, maybe certain sushi or fish dishes or pastas or, you know, and other things. So um, hopefully you will be turned on to this so that when you go to a restaurant and you see it on the list, you might want to buy the glass in. But anyway, um, all I'm trying to say is that Madeira is not the stuff your grandmother cooked with. Um, that is probably the perception that most of us have. Um, clearly in my dishes tonight, I've integrated Madeira, but the same goes that with cooking with wine, if you're not willing to drink it, you probably shouldn't cook with it. Um, Madeira is not a drink for old men with cigars in their hands. It is not a wine that is too sweet, that too many people run around saying. Um, it really is a wine that can be enjoyed at every occasion. It's got incredible acidity it, and it excites the palate. And it's something you can start at the beginning of the evening, in the meal or afterwards. So hopefully by the end of this hour, you'll just be a little more open to Madeira and you'll never run around with the, it's too sweet and it's too strong and all that stuff. Cause I'm gonna make converts of you all. So um, Madeira is an island. It's a, an historical island off the coast of uh, Portugal. And the cool thing is, is that Madeira is a wine named for an island and it's an island named for a wine. And they love to always say that in all of their marketing materials. We don't know which one really came first. Um, it's not a large island. It's only 35 miles long and 14 miles wide. And there are about 260,000 people that live on this island. It generally has a spring climate year round and some of the most magnificent views of the soaring mountains and the ocean pretty much everywhere you look. Um, to me, Madeira is a magical place. It's a magical island. And I made the first time, I've been to Portugal twice. And the first time I went, I was in Porto for work and I decided to go to Madeira for a couple of days on my own to explore it, as opposed to going to Lisbon or somewhere else. And it was just utterly, I mean, the views, you're standing on cliffs looking at the, I mean, it's magnificent. Um, and it is a popular destination for cruise ships. So what happens a lot of times is the cruise ships come up, people get off and there are, there's a very popular thing that you do. You go up a funicular to a top, you can go up a funicular and then at the top of the hill, there are these baskets, sled type things. And they go down this hill that these two guys run behind and push you. Um, and I'll have to find a photo to show you, but they push you as you're running down and um, you're speeding down a concrete hill in this basket with the two guys riding on the side once they run. And that's what the tourists do. Madeira is also known for lace. Um, in fact, the, the association, the wine association is actually the wine and lace association. So when you think of that beautiful intricate lace, maybe what you think of is Brussels doing well, or I mean a Bruges doing, uh, Madeira has beautiful hand embroidery things. Um, this is a region that goes back to the 15th century and that as Gina had said, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin, oh, and John Adams, all of our founding fathers toasted with Madeira when they signed the Declaration of Independence. So this is actually, um, the, the people in Madeira really do feel an affinity with America because of that. Um, they feel that this is our wine and hopefully more people will drink it. Um, like our previous three places, Madeira is an island. And what does an island mean? It means volcanic eruptions. And so this is a volcanic subtropical island. It has mountainous terrain, as Gina had said. It has an oceanic climate and tropical influences. And then the soils are really rich in iron and magnesium and phosphorus. And what's really fascinating is that on this island, I said it's 35 miles long and 14 miles wide, right? There are at least seven microclimates on this little island. It can be cool and rainy in one place and sunny and windy five minutes away. And it's really cool because when I had taken a tour around one day with, with friends that live there, they drove me and we left. And 20 minutes later, we had driven across the island and it was raining. And I'm like, 
all we did was go over a hill into another place. We, it took 20 minutes because we stopped for these punch-ons that they have, which is this um, alcoholic punch that you stop and they crush up all the fruit and the rum and they, or whatever, maybe Madeira in it, and you drink it. And so that's why it took 20 minutes to get across the island. I think we stopped three times for punch-ons. Um, Anyway, it, um, the vines are all planted on really steep slopes and they're grown in really tiny plots and mostly in a pergola system, which we've also seen in Italy. And this is where uh, they hang overhead. Um, they're coming up and you can walk under them. And this allows the grapes to access more air. So this tiny island has approximately 2000 growers on it. And 65% of the vineyards are located on the Southwest side of the island. And 35% are planted on the north coast. Um, Gina, I don't know if you're going to pop up another map there to show, but um, do you want a, a larger map with Morocco and no, uh, no, just, just a fine map? Okay, yeah, gotcha. Here you go. So, so you have the southwest side of the island um, down by Funchal, that whole kind of running up that side where Gina's mouse is, and that's the predominant area. And then on the north side. Um, there's about 35%. What's interesting is there are only eight Madeira producers on the island. You have 2000 growers, all with tiny little amounts, but there are eight producers on the island. There's Piera de Oliveira that started in 1820, Enrique and Enrique that started in 1850, Justino started in 1870, H&M Borges started in 1877, Madeira Wine Company, which is Blandy's um, connection, is 1913. Barbeto was in 1946. Faira and Filos in 1949. And then the cooperative um, Agricolo di Funchal was 1951. So there's not a lot of new producers. I mean, I think there was a new producer that started in the 90s or 80s, but that is not a common thing. There are just small producers uh, well, large producers, but only eight of them. Now, Madeira is a fortified wine like port and sherry, but do you know why it's different than port and sherry? Um, well, here's the thing. Madeira was a mistake. It was a mistake hundreds of years ago. Hundreds of years ago in the 1600s and 1700s, what the, the sailors would do is they would fortify wine when they were traveling on a ship. This is how we came across with port, um, sherry, all these things, because wine couldn't preserve itself. We didn't have, um, they were in casks and, you know, obviously casks breathe and everything. So they would fortify it by adding a neutral grain spirit so that it could make its way across the sea. Um, as the ships would travel through the tropics, the wine would heat up and it would cool down and it would heat up and it would cool down. And it was also exposed to oxygen. Now, when we talk about wine, the three enemies of wine are light, heat, and oxygen. Well, the poor wines in Madeira were exposed to everything. Uh, they were exposed to oxygen, heat, and cold. And um, this is what makes Madeira so incredibly special because Madeira loves heat, it loves oxygen, and it loves um, um, the warm and cool temperatures. And that is why you can pour it in a glass and not kill it after two weeks, <laughs> like Gina did. <laughs> um, there are numerous styles of wine produced in Madeira, but I wanna start first and talk about how Madeira is made because there are some similar things and then everything you know about wine is thrown out the door with Madeira. So the grapes are picked and they begin fermentation and before they finish fermentation, so fermentation typically ends when the grapes have, um, all the sugar has been converted to alcohol, hence why you have a dry wine. But when you are fortifying a wine before the fermentation ends, when there's still some residual sugar in there, you add a grape distillate um, and this stops the fermentation and fortifies the wine. And then the alcohol is added to the grape variety and it will result in varying levels of sweetness. So it's never a guarantee just because you stop fermentation, it's all gonna be the same level of sweetness. Um, the wine is then matured and it goes in the Cantero system. The Cantero system is like the barrels are in a lodge 
And this is where they're slowly warmed and exposed to oxygen and they age for years. So when I had gone into these lodges, um, they're every, when you go into a wine room, into a barrel room at a winery, you think of that, you know, that smell and that perfect cool air that you remember when you walk into any winery that you need a sweater. That is not what you experience in Madeira because it's about humidity and, and this kind of warmth. I mean, it's not a hot place. But um, when I had been walking through, I saw barrels with that were as early as the 1900s. And I even saw some barrels that said 1800 on them. And the estufes are the stainless steel tanks, which is a more modern way to do it. They can heat the wine faster than the Cantero system. So the Cantero system is these big wooden barrels that lets the oxygen breathe in and out. And now they've modernized it with some stainless steel tanks. Um, where they control the heat. And then when you're talking about three-year-old Madeiras, we're in five-year here. Those are all produced with the estufas and the stainless steel. Um, it's a little easier to produce. So really where Madeira gets its character is in the aging process. The wines really do not have primary aromas. Um, they don't have those aromas of fresh fruits, but they tend to get secondary and tertiary aromas. And each grape is produced to a different level of sweetness. And then the aromas and flavors will be different. So for Madeira, you can have dry, you can have medium dry, you can have medium sweet, and you can have sweet. And while the sweetness will vary from style to style, some of the common aromas and flavors you find in Madeira are apple, burnt sugar, dried fruits like raisins and figs, nuts like almonds and hazelnuts, chocolate, cinnamon, orange zest, coffee, tobacco, cocoa, caramel, honey, brown sugar, tea, cloves, pepper, vanilla. So to me, those are all really appealing <laughs> aromas and flavors. Um, but when you get into it more specifically, you have five, you have four, five, six grapes. You have Circeol, which we have one tonight, that tends to have fresh notes of green grass and citrus, and it produces the driest style of Madeira. You have Verdello, which you've probably seen Verdeo and others in other parts of Portugal. It tends to have aromas of orange peel and guava and produces a semi-dry style. You have Boal, which we have one tonight as well, which has notes of caramel, toffee, brown sugar, and figs, and produces a medium sweet style. And you then have Malvasia, which is also called Malmsey, M-A-L-M-S-E-Y. Um, and that tends to have aromas of molasses, and it doesn't have the same acidity that we'll find in these other three styles. It produces a really sweet Madeira. There is still always acidity. It's not cloying in any way. There's also the highly prized Tarantes, which was a nearly extinct grape that has notes of white almond and dried fruits. And it has the richest in structure of a Boal with the acidity of a Verdelo. So if you like well, we have an even more acidity with Circeal, but it, if you want something in the middle, Tarantes is amazing. And these are all white grapes. There's only one red grape grown on the island, Tinta Negra, and it produces a dry, a medium, dry, a medium, sweet, and a sweet wine. It can be used to do all of them. Um, so in addition to single variety wines, which we have all here, they are, you have different blends that give age definition, uh, designations. So you have finest, which is a three-year-old blended style. You have rainwater, which is the blend aged at least three years. You have reserve, which is aged between five to 10 years, special reserved aged 10 to 15 years and extra reserve 15 to 20. And then you can have a 20 year old, a 30 year old, a 40 year old or 50 year old. Um, no matter what the level of aging is, they are always between 17 and 22% alcohol. So they're, you know, keep sipping and <laughs> Marcy's going to have a good night's sleep. And <laughs> my, my wheelhouse like yours is at the hundred year plus. So whatever yeah. they call that. <laughs> but you it's know. interesting because one of the things that I learned when I was there that fascinated me is that I had done a story about, um, uh, this one woman who's making the wine for Enrique and Enrique. And she's not born on the island. She's from Portugal, but she's not native to Madeira. When she, she studied winemaking, but Madeira is a whole nother thing. And when she came, 
she spent a couple of years learning every single barrel in the winery, like every single one, because ultimately they're going to blend them and, and they're aging them. And the one thing she told me is that unlike, well, I shouldn't say that because I'm not 100% with port, but my assumption is that when you have a five-year, that the youngest wine would be five years old, but it could be a blend of anything else. Well, according to her and what I understand with Madeira, there are no rules that a five-year or 20-year or 30-year has a minimum age of 20 years in it, 30 years or whatever. It's about flavor. And it's the winemaker who knows what a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old is supposed to taste like. So when they're blending different vintages together, they know, and then it has to be approved by the association, by IVBAM, the Association of Madeira and Lace, um, who tastes every wine to verify, yes, this is a 10 year. Yes, this is what a five year. So, you know, if I understood all of that correctly, I found this to be the most fascinating thing because imagine how much knowledge, how much memory knowledge you have to have to be able to remember a style, one from another going on. So before I digress. <laughs> That's interesting though, because it sounds so subjective and, I, and you are right about port that that's how it works. So it sounds like it's a little more subjective with them. Mm -hmm. Although we we could read more about it, but that's fascinating. It is. So um, no matter what, the one thing that stands out about Madeira that I think stands out above all fortified wines is the acidity. No matter how sweet the Madeira is, the acidity is about freshness. It extends the length and the finish. And as you taste the wines and especially getting the second one, it cuts the sweetness. You get brown sugar notes, you get the caramelized notes, you get the sweetness, but it, but the acidity just cuts on the other side. So um, that is why I encouraged everyone to try it with food or cheese, because even the sweetest of wines have acidity to balance them, and that makes them really pairable with food. And so I know we're going to jump in to the um, Circeal and then the Boal, but at the very end, I will take you through a multi-course meal with each wine and how you could pair it if you wanted to get all five. You'd be really drunk at the end of the night, but um, <laughs> so. Uh, Allison, should we, should we say now is the time to highlight the first one while you talk about the grape? Um, yeah, I'm not going to go too far and I've already spoken a little bit about it. So if you want to talk about the Blandies a little bit, because sure. we have their producers, and then we can all talk about what we're tasting in the Circeal and how it works with your cheeses and such. Perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as Allison said, obviously we've got these two different grape varieties uh, that we're tasting, which I mean, I, I knew enough about Madeira before, but I remember first learning about Madeira and I just assumed just like most people probably did at the beginning of their like wine education, that there's only one sweet style of wine. And that's, that's always stuck with me how, um, and I didn't know that about the microclimates, Allison, how tiny this island is and how large the, the variety of styles that there is coming from such a small area. So I've been really, really enjoying that. And I've been going back and forth with between the two wines because it is really cool to be able to taste them the dry Madeira, while it is technically dry by their standards, it still does have a sweetness to it, which I really enjoy. Um, and then the the Boal is just like, I'm drooling over here. <laughs> I'm actually drooling, so sorry. I gotta say, if you, I was gonna say this later, but if you like melted brown sugar, I mean, the Boal is melted brown sugar. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but all that said, I mean, if I'm describing it to someone, I'm not gonna use the word brown sugar because it pulls back from like the sweetest, most cloying tendencies of what brown sugar is. Like if we actually took a spoonful of it, we'd be like, whoa, you know? So it just, it's like, it cuts, there's like some spot where it just cuts it off. And like the way we, we learned to talk about Riesling um, reminds me of this. I'm not sure if it's really the same technically here, but instead of saying sweet, we say, uh, degrees of fruit, you know, degree, ripe, ripeness of fruit is what you're really thinking about. But in Madeira, how, how does that work technically? In Madeira, it's sweetness. Okay. But even still, these just don't strike me as that sweet. And because I'm a person that does not eat 
candy. I don't eat sugar. No, I'm not a, I do not have a sweet tooth. What you would be surprised is it's because of the level of acidity mm -hmm. that it blocks it. You do not taste how sweet these wines are. There's a lot of residual sugar in them. They're 19% mm -hmm. they're alcohol. There's a lot of sugar. You don't want to drink a lot of this at one time. This is, this is a- <laughs> Too late. Too this late. is a, no, I mean, it's good sugar and it's good <laughs> alcohol compared to like having like, you know, a bunch of Long Island iced teas or something. But you know, it's, you know, it, it, it's got the sugar in it. It's just very deceiving. And that's so when why- you, So when, when you're hanging with the pros, pros, they will just say sweetness. They won't try and use a euphemism. Because with Riesling, if you say the word sweet at a Riesling tasting, you're going to be thrown out the front but door. But that is because the sweetness from Riesling is about when they pick the grapes, which is a level of sugar ripeness, whereas Madeira is all about the grape. And then also, I mean- Choices I regarding to, residual sugar. I mean, there is residual sugar in all of these. You just don't taste it because the acidity. I love it. <laughs> I'm in love with it. Gina, tell Thank us you. about the Blandy family. They've been around a long time. They have. So I'm going to do a quick little, well, it's, it's not quick. It's it's faster. It's longer than my fun facts. But I, I thought doing an actual timeline of their family history, because it is so important. When you think of Madeira, a lot of people think of Blandies because they have been around for so long. Um, they're actually, the family is the only family of all of the original founders of the Madeira wine trade that still own and manage their own original wine company. So that's a lot to say, especially because the Blandy's wine company, well, I'll get into that in a minute, but the original company owned and operated by the Blandy family started in 1811. So that's over 200 years old. Um, and that's not necessarily the oldest winery we've ever talked about, but in terms of an island wine and this such such a unique style of wine, I, it's just amazing. And if you meet the Blandies, because I've met many of them, they're they're Caucasian. Their they are. I mean, they're all Portuguese <laughs> now, but their heritage is they were English um, 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 merchants and English, uh, you know, traders, which is why you have name like. Uh, Blandies or the same thing with port when you think of like Coburn's like Cockburn's that none of us can say properly um, but yeah these are all English and a few German families that that came over and were in the trade so yeah it enough I mean it's really obvious too. like going through their website they have um, actually the one of the largest collection of staff members that are highlighted on their website that I've seen in all of the wines that I featured in the last four years of owning my own company, usually it's like the winemaker, the CEO, and then like the seller cat or something like that. And this list is like, it is beefy. And it, I think that really goes to show not only like how important the staff is to the Blandy's family, but also like how integral each different person is in the growing of the grapes, the picking, you know, every single step down um, through the winemaking process and then pass that into the sales process as well. So I really respected that. I, I it's very rare to see that. Um, so anyways, I digress. Um, this family. So throughout its history on the island, the family has played a leading role in, in the development of Madeira wine and members of the family continue to live in Madeira and maintain the tradition that goes back to 1811. Um, so John Blandy is the original founder of Blandy's and arrived in Madeira in 1808. Um, in 1811, he founded his own business as a wine shipper and general trader with his brothers Thomas and George and started to set the foundation for the family and the island itself with the production of the most famous and unique wine in the world, which is our Madeira. Um, the company soon started exporting wine to the four corners of the world and to places as far as Russia, Northern Europe, Antilles, and North America. And in order to broaden their activity, they also began importing various products from other origins. Um, John Blandy's son, Charles Blandy, continued the business, um, and Charles brought the Blandy Wine Lodges to Fucal, also known as the Agates de São Francisco in 1840. And then um, in 1852, there was a really disastrous plague. A lot of people died called the Oedium or Odium Plague. 
I saying that right, Allison? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> um, and it was Charles Blandy again, who had the foresight to buy up a great, oh shush, uh, a great um, proportion of the stocks of old wine on the island, which safeguarded his company and future uh, companies continuing that were able to continue to sell Madeira wine. In 1925, Blandy's decided to join the Madeira Wine Company, which is what Allison mentioned earlier, one of the existing, one of the eight existing uh, Madeira companies on the island. And, um, and the Madeira Wine Company is a group of wine companies formed together to maximize global exposure and minimize the overheads in uh, the export market, which is uh, at times experienced a really, really tough time throughout our history. Um, in 18, I'm sorry, in 1989, in order to further expand the global market, the Blandys approached another Anglo-Portuguese family uh, named the Symingtons of Oporto, and, uh, and uh, they were port producers in the 19th or since the 19th century, and they offered them a partnership with the newly named Madeira Wine Company, and this partnership continues today. Um, today, Michael and Chris Blandy, um, there's been a number of Christophers and Charles. So Michael and Chris Blandy today are members of the sixth and seventh generations of the Blandy family and continue to work in the family, which is today run by Chris mainly. And uh, they are the world's leading producers of premium quality Madeira. Gina, if yes. you allow screen share, I can show you pictures of their um, tasting area. Absolutely. While you're talking. Um, is that in like security or something? There we go. You should be able to do that. Um, so while Allison is showing some pictures, I wanted to talk about the Blandy's focus on sustainability. Um, because of course these islands are affected desperately. Um, and so they use, um, 440 solar panels in their winery, um, which result in a 30% electricity reduction, and they produce 55,000 uh, kilowatts of energy. Um, they also use a large number of recycled water, which is great because apparently in certain parts of the island, it rains quite a bit. Um, and that results in a 19% volume reduction um, since 2014 in their water use. Are you showing pictures, Allison? I'm trying. I don't know if they're coming through. Are they? Yeah, I can see them. Okay. I, I'm almost done with my sustainability. So list. these were from your trip, right, Allison? Yeah, I was there in 2017. Cool. So this is visiting their tasting room in Funchal. Um, awesome. Um, another interesting sustainability uh, note is that they've actually significantly reduced the weight of the actual glass. Um, that they put their Madeira in by 35%, um, which I don't think, I think right now, at least in, in the U.S., there's, a, there's an assumption that the heavier the bottle, it, the, heavier, the, the heavier the bottle, the more, the higher quality the wine is inside, and that's just not true. Um, it absolutely is a marketing ploy. Um, and so it's really important that massive companies like this focus on bringing down the weight in their bottle, because not only is it cheaper for them to produce, but um, it significantly decreases the, uh, the carbon footprint come, starting from the winery. So it, it gets exported, that heaviness creates a heaviness on the ships and the planes and the trains that it's transported through all over the world. Then it lands um, at the importer who then has to send it to the retailers such as myself. I received a case of this. That's, that was you know weight used in transit. And then I send all these bottles out to you guys, which results in a heavier package, which, which ultimately costs the customers more money or myself more money. Um, but so it's, it's really great that they're starting to decrease the weight in their bottles because that is cheaper and better for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also, if you guys noticed, as you opened up the cork here, it's not actually a real cork, um, and that's just fine. Um, these are still extremely high quality uh, synthetic corks that um, reduce the pressure put on the cork trees throughout the world as well. Um, and 
they they a quote from the owners is in no other agricultural activity the influence of the climate is more evident than in viticulture um it is our responsibility as wine producers and distributors to contribute this to the sustainability of our sector Poppy, shush sorry my <laughs> thoughts. I'm really excited about madeira um we believe that small changes have a positive impact in the preservation of our planet and in the reduction of our ecological footprint. And you can actually monitor their carbon footprint dating back to 2010 on their website as well. So they are, they're really into it as am I, and I really love that about them. Um, and Allison, okay, back to you. Actually, oh, I was just flipping through photos as you were talking, showing the old bottles, but I stopped on this because this is the four that I was talking about. You have Cercial, Verdello, Bual, and Momsey, and you can see how they get darker in color as they are richer in style. Um, and that was tasting their 10 years of the of the four. And this we is the town. Tried to get a Momsey for this tasting, but it they were fully like out. That wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is the town of uh, you know beautiful fruits and all the cool things they have. They were they were reenacting like the old way of life, but there's um let me um stop sharing for a second and show you a picture of the islands because that is what will is um the most beautiful part of Madeira is just that it's these magnificent views everywhere you look. So, um, oh, this is the, um, sorry, this is the, these are the carts that they take you down. Here, you sit in one of these things and they run with you as you go down a hill super fast. <laughs> these baskets <laughs> just the trend um let's see that's and uh i'll come back i'll stop sharing until i can find the photo that i want but um what what is everyone thinking of the first wine of the cercial I, um, because no one else is at this moment, uh, I think it's really gorgeous. Um, I find it a little bit more nutty and kind of, um, slightly more savory than the, the Bual, the, the sweeter one. I keep mixing them up on my table. Um, but I was just really impressed and I didn't have the opportunity to cook anything this evening but I am definitely going to tap into some of those recipes that I sent you guys because it's really fun to cook with wine and actually incorporate it in as one of the ingredients with food if you guys haven't done that much before. Um, but I think that this wine, more so than like a normal dry wine or a table wine that you know we normally drink, this really um, has the ability to hold up a lot more than any other kind of wine. And that's I mean, that's because of the alcohol content, it's because of the acidity, and it's also, of course, because of the sweetness that we're perceiving on our palate. Um, so yeah, please, please actually cook with it. If you enjoy cooking, it's yeah. Um, here, I'll jump in and show you a couple more. This is, um, this was driving to the other side of the island. These were our punch-ons that we were doing, but we had come from sun, and then we were suddenly in this cloudy, this is on the north side of the island where it was a little more overcast, but you see the vines and these beautiful old vines, but um... I'll just jump in and say, I'm gonna start buying more Madeira because this is just yeah. opening my eyes. I mean, I've been drinking a fair amount of sherry lately, but we've been getting it for the show and this is reminding me of that, but it has more complexity than a lot of sherry I've been drinking. And I am not just the word sweet. Every time I hear it, I hear it conceptually and theoretically, but I'm so, my palate is so um, overtaken by the acid and by the spice, the spice qualities and sweet, sweeter sort of spices that we dissociate, like uh, 
cinnamon, cardamom, um, nutmeg, but then also more exotic sort of Moroccan spices like cumin, obviously, and uh, things like that, you know? So, and when I think of cinnamon, I'm thinking of like cinnamon, not cinnamon sugar that we put on our toast or whatever, but actual cinnamon. It's like, and it, it kind of has a little bit of that bitterness, but really just the high acid content and the lingering finish is outrageous. I mean, I'm having it with salty, salty salami and olives. And then I'm, I'm like, I keep turning off my video because I'm eating these beef ribs that I made <laughs> that I cooked for like six hours. And I'm like, it's ridiculous. Like, there's just like, I'm like gorging myself on fat and salt, but I can't stop. It's so yeah. freaking delicious <laughs> and I would say, with this wine. And I would say that like, cause I ate the pasta, which I'll have some more after where I cooked, I, I used the, um, the, the cerciol in that sauce the, the mm. cream sauce with the shrimp and mm. and it was a beautiful pairing because the acidity shone through it stood up to the creaminess and and it was mm -hmm. delicious and now i'm moving into this cheese and mm -hmm. i can see the you know it's the nuanced difference this cheese is um got a chalky-ish texture but it's also very rich and big and you need more of the boal style that richness that cuts through it it's good with the cerciol there's nothing wrong with it but the cerciol is almost a little too lean for this cheese. Um, and if you were going to take yourself through a meal, these are recommendations. So cerciol, which we have, can be enjoyed with sushi, which is what Kim is eating tonight, right? How is, how Katie is and that? Kevin, Katie okay. and Kevin, you guys have chicken. <laughs> Sorry. Katie and Kevin have sushi. So you can have cerciol can be with sushi and salads. And then Verdello pairs well with oysters and seafood and pâtés. Uh, Bual is good with chocolate and tropical fruits, but it's also really good with cheese. Um, and Malvasia can be enjoyed with coffee or a traditional Madeira cake, which is a molasses spice cake, which is quite good. Which one so, was that? that, that pardon me? The, the one you just said, which one was that? A Madeira no, like, cake. Yeah, so it's, the cake you're going to pair with which? which with which the Malvasia. Malvasia. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's called Madeira Bolo de, del Mel, a molasses, a molasses spice cake. And then another way to do it is you start with cerciol and a little cheese. Then you have verdello with roasted chicken and finish with a bual with chocolate dessert or a Malvasia with pecan pie. I mean, there's so many different ideas. Um, the biggest thing to know about Madeira, it is utterly indestructible. It's a wine that can be stored anywhere, in any mm. position. Open bottles will last indefinitely. They're unlikely to oxidize and go bad because they've already been oxidized in their process. Um, so, you know, I have, I was going through my wine fridge behind me and I'm like, oh yeah, I have a wall that's open from another producer. I forgot when I opened that, but I don't have to stress about it compared to like the screw cap white wine I opened earlier today that I had to give to my neighbor since I won't drink it in the next two days, you know? <laughs> um, so my biggest suggestion, and I'm glad Mike is on board with this, is I say pick up a bottle or two and, and, and try different Madeiras with your meals because if our founding fathers thought this was good enough to drink when they signed the Declaration of Independence, I think we should be enjoying it every day as well. <laughs> Well, how patriotic. <laughs> what difference would that make? <laughs> I think one sip of each of these bottles and you're going to want to have more Madeira. The, 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 the most, patriotic thing I don't know about. <laughs> the most um, important document signed, the Declaration of Independence, they felt Madeira was. And the reality is when we think about it, they were probably having a balmsy or you know a, a much the more sweeter styles when you think back to that style it was probably not a cerciol or a verdello but um hey you know it's a part of our american history <laughs> Mike, tell us about what? your super fancy three michelin star pairing with your i will but i want to note whenever allison she's very smart lady clearly but whenever she says something really silly like kind of like uh she always says well you know <laughs> like, <laughs> to follow it up because she knows her brain saying like wow that's kind of dumb <laughs> like, we're all thinking wow that's weird that was kind of dumb <laughs> she's like well you know 
<laughs> you know. <laughs> they were drinking during the Declaration of Independence. Like, it must be great. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> All right. Sorry. You're not wrong, Allison. It's rare that I can get a genuine dig in and have a <laughs> uh, I had an amazing Madeira at Clove Club, which is like a top 20 uh, Pellegrino list uh, uh, Michelin star place in London in uh, December of 2017. They brought out this, uh, you know, it was this incredible meal. And by like the 10th course, they bring out this, um, it was a 1908 Boal Madeira. And uh, I was very excited to see this arrive at our table. Um, and I looked it up on Wine Searcher later. It was like $900 a bottle or something. I'm pretty sure they got a better price than that. But they poured us all a nice ample pour of it and in a big glass like this. And we were told to really, I don't remember if they swirled it for us or we had to swirl it to really coat the glass. Um, and I actually remember it was funny because they poured it and I wanted to then spend about 20 minutes to like sniff it and you know examine it and drink it and like slowly like enjoy it and they're like no the one part I didn't like is they're like no 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 drink it up drink it. lord <laughs> like I'm not gonna just guzzle this down this is an amazing moment for me so eventually we drank it it was phenomenal I don't know if I have any um specific notes other than it just was like life-changingly complex and interesting. I wish I could have spent two hours sipping on it. Um, but then they poured in a, like some sort of a beef consomme into the same glass. And then you were to drink that. And it was a phenomenal experience. Um, and if you search like Clove Club Madeira online, you can read different trip reports of people having different variations of that dish. But it was top two dinners of my life. And that was one of the most interesting amazing for me, just being a wine nerd dishes of my life. And I think Allison has had an older Madeira than me. No, wait, what year was yours? 1908, I believe. Oh, okay, yeah. So here, here is my, uh, I found the picture, just so you know. But it was at the winery. So, I mean, it's not like I was at a restaurant doing this, but 1863. Wow. And it was incredible. It still had so much acidity and it was gorgeous. And then I'm just going to flip to show you. Um, hold on. There was a picture of this is what Madeira is. This is why it is the most beautiful place. It is just an extraordinarily magical island that is worth a visit. Do you know off the top of your head, like, so you fly into Portugal or London or Paris or whatever international airport you fly into, then you fly directly to Madeira? Like, how did you get over there? Um, I flew into Madeira, which was an interesting flight um, <laughs> because my worst landing was into Porto that trip because we flew, I flew into Lisbon and then flew up to Porto. And that was um, very scary due to storms that were going on. I think we circled the airport three times and returned to Lisbon and we never landed, but every time they tried to take us into Porto, I mean, I have never been so scared on a flight in my life. So when I arrived in Madeira, everything was fine. I arrived at night and one of the producers who I'm friends with picked me up and um, I said to him, well, that wasn't bad at all. And he said, well, it's a good thing you arrived at night because if you could see the airport, you wouldn't want to land here because it's like a strip with a cliff, you know? I mean, it's not a big island. <laughs> and it's like, um, so yeah, I mean, you fly in there and you can fly from Porto, Lisbon. I don't know if you can fly. I think you have to fly through an another city like that. I don't know that you can fly in from London into it. You'd fly into Porto first or into Lisbon first. Um, I think I saw on the map, it's it's a little bit north of the Canary Islands. I believe, yes, I believe I will so. say just, I wasn't here for the Canary Islands case, so I'll just mention this. I don't know if you mentioned it, but my, my kids, my two older kids in their 20s, did a lot of traveling uh, through London, through Gatwick, if anybody's interested in this. And they, they flew everywhere, including Canary Islands. And some of the flights were through Ryanair, like domestic into the EU. And they were outrageously inexpensive. Like, like it was like nine euros one way 
to go to like Madrid or like Canary Islands, like $19, 19 not dollars, euros one way. It's like incredible, like yeah. value. The two this islands, was in 2017. But. The two islands, there's the Azores and Madeira. Oh, I'm to the Azores. Oh, I'm jealous. But, but not, but no, but not, not, not really. We, we only were in the Azores because of our wild trip to get back to the United States that involves somebody bribing an airline person and winding up on a flight that went through the Azores where they made everybody get off the plane. And we were worried that that meant we were not going to be allowed back on the plane. And they only had one flight through a week. So I didn't really go to the Azores, but it would have been a, it wouldn't have been the worst thing to be stuck in the Azores for a week. Well, it would have if we had not made it back, my dad and I, for Passover, which was why we were so desperate. <laughs> my, my mother would have just, she was already ready to kill us. And when we did finally show up after what we refer to as the last train from Berlin trip, because the whole trip was crazy. And the reason I was nodding when you were talking about your flight into Porto was our trip started with a flight like that into Lisbon, where they where the Portuguese pilot could not land. And he kept going down, 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 and the plane would shake and the plane would shake and it was all white and he'd go back up and he'd come around and he'd go back and everyone on the plane's going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And finally he just flies all the way back down to the Algarve. And then 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 our wild wild trip went from there. And yeah, when, when, we... the pi when the pilot was trying to land, he, f he was flying into Porto he starts to land. I mean, we were doing drops that felt like we were dropping 30 feet. I mean, I don't know how much it just felt. I have never dropped so much. And I was like grabbing on and I'm like, okay, it can't be that bad. It can't be that bad. And, and for like three minutes, we'd be dropping and dropping and dropping. And then suddenly it would calm again. And 20 minutes later, it would drop and drop. So what it turned out is he kept trying to land and then he'd come back up and he'd circle around and then he'd try again. And every time it I was by myself and this lady next to me on the plane grabbed me and started petting me. She goes, you're not alone. And I was like, I was like, I've never been so scared on a flight in my entire life. I mean, I was really like, holy crap, is this what it, I mean, I've never, ha I'm not a fan of turbulence to begin with. That was the scariest thing I've ever been on. So I'm scared when, hearing about it. Yeah, so when I was warned about Madeira. You're not selling this vacation very well. But no, but that was Porto, Porto. No, Madeira was simple. I flew in, I flew out, no issues. But no issues, she came at night. You didn't see the runway. That's right. I have a friend that was in the Azores and it looked like an amazing, yeah. beautiful place. Kathy, who's come to a lot of these tastings. In fact, her little dog, Remy, she rescued in the Azores. I have friends in, Sac in Sacramento, actually. There's someone on here who's up in Sacramento. Uh, in Sacramento and their family's from the Azores and they actually, she, she says she still has property there. It'd be nice. But yeah. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted. Property you. in the Azores. Okay. That would be nice. <laughs> Marcy, you were the other one who's been to, uh, I almost said the Canary Islands, to Madeira, or to Portugal, right? But not Madeira. Yeah. But not Madeira, right. What right. was your favorite part about Portugal? Well, we, my, <clears throat> My dad always wanted to have a place outside the country. You know, I don't know why, maybe in case there's a revolution or something here. So he, my parents bought property in Portugal um, in 1971 and built a house in the Algarve. And they had that house for like 20 years. So I, because my brother and I were by then, by the time the house was finished, we're both in college. We didn't go so much. My parents, my dad retired when he was like 45 and then he would only work sort of sometimes when he felt like it. And so he would take off the entire summer. They would be gone for like 14 weeks in the summer. They'd be gone a couple of weeks at Christmas, a couple of weeks in the spring. My brother and I would just live in the house in New York. And, but we went a bunch of times. My brother and his wife and I went after I graduated law school we went over the three of us and we traveled around the country. We didn't fly to Porto because we, we, we drove everywhere once we got there. And then we stayed at the house. Well, my dad sold the house um, probably in the early nineties. Um, Just when you really need an escape to Europe. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 
you always say you shouldn't regret things in your life because if you regret not doing something and then you play out all the things mm -hmm. that wouldn't have happened if you had done that other thing. Yeah, so when no, I, but regretting what your parents done, that is a terrific pastime. No, no, no. But, <laughs> okay. But when I was like, a, you know, when I was, there was someone on here once who was going to go to law school, but I don't think they're on here. So I can say this. When I was like a third year lawyer, which is kind of when in big law, when everyone's like really depressed and why the hell did I go to law school, right? Um, I, I like didn't know like, would I keep doing it? What should I do? What should I do? And my mother, who was also, I think a master of reverse psychology. So I don't know what she would have done if I had said yes. But my mother said to me, Marcy, you know, if you want, you could go to the house and live there for a year and figure out like what you want to do. And you didn't say yes? You said no? <laughs> I'm like, Marcy, I don't know if you're allowed You to. would say yes now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or for any time in the past 40 years, like, yes. Yes, yes. please, can I please? <laughs> that one year she hit the sweet spot where you were like, old enough to say yes and wouldn't. It was like, horrible. <laughs> I mean, I understand. I a great place. And when we when we first went, like they built this house, um, and we you know we didn't have telephones um, because they hadn't laid the line yet from Portimao to Lagos for more phones. The little guys would ride their bicycles out there with their pickaxes, and they would dig the thing and lay this little cable. And it took like years and years and years and years and years. So like when the Portuguese had the revolution the New York Times, the articles made it sound really bad. You know, it's a revolution. And because there was no telephone, we couldn't call our parents who were there. So we sent um, a telegram, but we were really cryptic because that goes like to the main office. And then somebody rides out on a bicycle and brings it to you. And there's a lot of people who know English uh, in the Algarve, and we we didn't know a revolution. We don't want our parents to get into trouble, depending on what we tell them. So of course, the parents didn't even understand our cryptic, our cryptic thing. But we did it that way because when the dictatorship was in power, sometimes you'd go down a newsstand and you couldn't buy the International Herald Tribune or you couldn't buy Time Magazine um, because uh, there would have been some article that they had found that the dictatorship had found critical of them. And so they would just not let the publication even be distributed and you wouldn't be able to get it. But it was a, it's a beautiful, beautiful country and really nice people. And yeah, we spent time there, but I'm sure my brother and I both wish that we had spent more time um, when my parents had the house than, than we actually did. My sister who's passed away last year, my sister was much younger than us. so. Every time my parents went, she went. But that one trip with the crazy um, last train from Berlin was me and my dad alone, which was a lot of fun. E even the crazy trip was a lot of fun. Um, we didn't Are make it back. This? You have like a screenplay, Marcy, on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write a book. Have you written a book? Like, this will be Marcy Book Club. You need to call uh, a really good screenwriter and talk for like 20 hours and I'm love the podcast. best movie of the I'm year. I'm in for a podcast, Marcy Jo. Yes. <laughs> the, last, the last train from Berlin. So we, <clears throat> we drive like that. Uh, we drive from our house to the Faro Airport's probably, I don't know, 45 minutes. So we get to Faro Airport. We take that plane ride where they don't land. We come back to Faro Airport. And our big thing was that we were supposed to get back in time for Passover, which was very important to my mother and was going to be at our aunt's, my aunt's house in Connecticut. And so from the Faro airport, we send a telegram to my mother saying, you know, we're going to try to get there, whatever we say. And then we're trying to get on planes. There was one more flight that was going up to Lisbon that would have made our connection. It was a Lufthansa flight, but there was only one seat. And we didn't want to split up. And so we didn't. You know, the upshot of that is that the Portuguese pilot could not land in Lisbon. Lufthansa German pilot, he landed no problem. So anyway, we rent a car in Faro to then drive the three hours to Lisbon, desperately trying to get to this plane. 
They were just building some new highways north and south. And um, we wind up on some road. I'm like, dad, I think this road's not even open. I don't even know how he got on it. And we're driving. He does something to try to, with like the turn signal thing comes off in his hand. It was just a wild trip. We get to the airport. We've missed the connection. Plus TAP used to fly like a plane to New York. And then they fly the same plane back, right? Back and forth on the route. And for two weeks, they were having all this fog. And so they had people backed up in hotels in Lisbon. They couldn't get us on a plane. We had to we get make them put us up in the Hotel Tivoli, which at the time was a really excellent hotel. And we have to call my mother and tell her we were not able to get on a plane. We will try again in the morning. We're going to try to get there. But this is so, I mean, it wasn't that long ago. It was my first year of law school. I guess that was 40 years ago, uh, 40 something years ago. So we have to wait for the overseas operator to get an open line. And all my mother wants to know is, are you going to be there for dinner tomorrow night? We don't know. We don't know. So that's, we, called, a, that's called a Jewish, a Jewish mother. <laughs> have, you escaped, have you escaped the revolution and got on a damn flight because it's Passover <laughs> dinner, get home. <laughs> right. And so and we have no luggage because our luggage was still with TAP on the stupid plane that never landed. And so my dad goes down to get his toothpaste or whatever. We get up really early. We go to the airport. I remember like sitting on like one of those airport scales like this, you know, because I'm like half asleep. And he's trying, he's looking at the board, trying to figure out where the hell can we go? He, he's like, if we go to Amsterdam, we could maybe we could go to Amsterdam. Then we could like, he's in a panic that we're not going to get home because like he's married to this woman. So we, he buys us like first class tickets to Amsterdam just in case we can't get on a TAP flight to New, to, to New York or anywhere, figuring if we go to Amsterdam, I don't know what he was thinking, but that we would get out of Portugal, we'd be better off. And he, meantime, we're hanging around other people just sort of listening in on conversations. And there was this cluster of people around a TAP man in his uniform and they're talking to him. These people were trying to get to Boston. And what they wound up doing was they bribed this guy to get them on the plane to Boston. This was the plane that's gonna go through the Azores. My dad and I were standing there. So this guy thought we were with these people who had bribed them. So we get on the plane doo, 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 to go to the Azores, to go to Boston. And my dad's thinking, okay, if we go to Boston. Should we take the shuttle to LaGuardia? No, we got to get to Stanford. Maybe we rent a car. I mean, he's trying to plot this whole thing out. And then we land in the Azores and they make everybody get off the plane and go stand in the little tin hut that's the like terminal <laughs> or something. And all of us who had been like bribed onto the plane were like, oh my God, as I said before, maybe, you know, he got us on this plane and now we're going to get kicked off because maybe there's just people or whatever. So when they, they just kicked everybody off the plane so they could like vacuum it. And then when they wanted everybody back on the plane, there was like these six or seven people in the front running to get back on the plane, all the people who had been part of this bribe pool. We land in Boston. My dad rents a car. We are exhausted. It's like, you know, dark. And at some point it gets dark. We're driving across Massachusetts. Desperately, we're driving across Massachusetts. I think we changed out. Like he drove, then I drove. We finally, we pull into, we drive across Massachusetts down into Connecticut. We, thank God the states are small. We pull into the driveway of my aunt's house, bang on the door for them to open it. When we walk into the dining room, they have just finished clearing all of the dishes off the table. My uncle is still sitting there, but they're all, they've are all they cleared all the dishes. My mother comes out of the kitchen and she looks at us and she says, oh, good, you're here. <laughs> Jewish guilt. Yes. You. Anyone who has a Jewish mother knows exactly what that's like. <laughs> Did you get any yeah. matzo ball soup at least? <laughs> <laughs> I had to borrow clothes from my cousin. Oh my god, it's just it was it was so a wild trip. My, like, my it was just wild. Oh, Marcy, I mean nothing to that degree, but one year doing Passover at my aunt and uncle's in Orange County, and I had to leave after work, and my brother and I just could not. I mean, we had to finish working before we could leave, and we rushed to get down there in rush hour traffic. 
and they don't wait for us. And they're like, oh, you made it. And I'm like, you guilt us into like leaving work. We can't leave work. We get down here. You couldn't even wait 20 minutes for us to get here. You had to start without us. Like, <laughs> so yes, I'm very familiar with how the family works. <laughs> well, I will say that Portugal is a proper democracy today. The revolution is over. They are no longer a dictatorship. Um, but it is a fascinating country to visit because it is one of the top des tourist destinations. I mean, uh, Portugal was was like number one pre-COVID um, as a destination for tourism. And it makes sense. I mean, they are it's such a beautiful country, great history, but they really have a young history as the country we know it today because they were a dictatorship up until, you know, what, 40 years ago, 50 years ago? Yeah, like 1972, once, 1972 maybe, 73, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know. But Madeira is off the beaten path. It's not easily accessible the way, you know, because it's not on the mainland, but I highly encourage anyone to go because it is just, it's magical, it's beautiful. It's, and you can drink old Madeira. On that note, um, we have some, we're not, I'm not ending this call because there's some fun announcements and, um, uh, some questions that I have for everyone. Um, of course, you'll get this, uh, my normal follow-up email on Monday morning um, with the recording and um, a final call for any, if anyone wants any of the wines. We have uh, received a lot of pre or reorders, so I don't have very much left of anything, but you'll get the final count. I know I do have three bottles of each of the Madeiras uh, left that I'm able to sell unless you want my, my half bottle, <laughs> pre drunk. Um, but so you'll get that if you wanted anything else. Of course, now actually, if you want to order the wines, I will send you um, all of the wines that you've collected um, throughout this. And um, I'm gonna do a quick wine cult plug before we finish off with an exciting uh, date, save the date for, um, our in-person tasting. Um, so before COVID, before we all met, um, my company, we, none of you have been to my house except for Allison as of recently. Um, and actually Kim and Eddie, you guys have come and pick up some wine um, as you're coming through town. But so we operate, Wine Gold headquarters is here in our home. We have a really fun little back office where we do all of our shipping from. Um, and we used to host these really fun, crazy backyard tastings. And now that the majority of us are vaccinated and we're all, you know, kind of getting out in the world, we decided we should do a little three-part in-person tasting series um, that is basically just to help us move through our inventory that we have really done a good job of stocking up on. <laughs> um, so we are going to be launching a three-part tasting series that starts uh, actually in a couple of weekends. Um, on, I, and you will all get an email invitation about this, um, but we're doing one in-person tasting a month, starting on October 18th, then, I'm sorry, September 18th, then October 23rd, and finishing up in, uh, on November 20th. Um, each tasting has its own special theme. The first one that we're doing in a couple of weeks from now is going to be like a big ass tasting. Like we're going to be opening up opening up at least 15 bottles of wine um, that we do this type of tasting once a year. Um, it's like, we call it our grand tasting and our cellar raid because we put a bunch of stuff on crazy sale that we never do via email. Um, and I know that some of you are relatively local enough where if you wanted to come up, we would love to have you. Um, the uh, um, October one is gonna be Halloween themed because that's just fun. Um, we are gonna be doing a wine tasting featuring Final Girl Wines, which is a fantastic local wine company, um, female winemaker, and her husband is from, uh, he's a Kiwi. And so they team up and um, they, their label is all focused around the um, uh, femme fatale, like the main female characters from horror films. So we'll be doing a movie screening in our backyard. We've got a really big uh, projector that we'll do um, as well as a wine tasting for the with the final girl wines 
And then of course, we're going to be doing like a holiday uh, sparkling wine stock up big sale there. And then a, another big wine tasting um, and Thanksgiving uh, pairing on in November. So we're going to be doing that. You do have to get tickets, but um, we are going to be selling bundles of all three. So if anyone is interested in joining all three, you can get some discounted tickets and they're cheap. We're due. It's like $20 a day. And it's just like, we'll get you drunk. We'll have a really good time. It's basically just to help cover any food that we bring in for the tasting as well. And sometimes we do live music as well. So Anyways, enough about just me, but of course the point of inviting all of you guys is because it would be so much fun to see you in person, which then finally leads me into back to the focus of our fantastic group that we've been fostering. We've been talking about doing an in-person tasting forever, and we actually can now. Um, so I'll put this in the email and on Monday as well, but we are thinking October 9th for a wine tasting. Put it in your calendar now. You'll get more information because we haven't planned anything else past that. But that is the date. Um, that is the date before the holidays seem to kind of kick everyone up into their family visiting and traveling tizzy that I know I myself get sucked into. So um, if you're interested in joining, we will, of course, um, make it as budget friendly as possible. But we really do want to give you a really good experience. I know Allison's got some ideas. I've got some really fun ideas. We've all got some great uh, winery connections. So we promise a, a fun afternoon. And I want to put it out there for the LA people wanting to come up. Um, if there's anyone who would want to do a two night, like an overnight, not a two full day, but an overnight where we go up, we do Saturday, spend the night and maybe do something add it on Sunday before we come back. Um, maybe Jeannie you can put it out there because, you know, I can figure out and see what I can do to help with accommodations for one night, you know, see what, what our options are out there. If we want to be up in, in San Inez for an extra little extra time so that we're not, yeah. you know, because I know we talked about being in your backyard and it could always be that we go up Saturday, spend the night. And then on Sunday, come by your backyard in the afternoon on the way home. <laughs> My house is not your to house, invite Andy. ourselves, but we talked all about this. <laughs> oh, no, no. She already invited pregnant. us last time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Count me in. Count me in. Count me in. But, um, count me in love for an overnight. Hosting. That is one of my favorite things. When people invite themselves over to my house, that means you're my true friend. So congratulations. You've made it to that level, Allison. Um, yes, absolutely. Whatever whatever we want to do. And if, if my house works into that as a kind of a landing, a home base, that's great. I love that. Because I can always check with like somewhere like the sideways in and see if they would do a one night because it's a great little hotel. It's right off the freeway. And if they'll do a one night um, stay, you know, they're usually, um, you know, a pretty, pretty affordable way to stay in San Inez. Is, is that the cute one that you had on your thing that has 18 little like? No, that's the, that's, that's the hotel too. San Inez, which is gorgeous. But I, I've written about the San probably Inez. already booked, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, Hotel San Inez is, um, is a two night minimum and on the weekends they're booked out because they're super like, but I figure, yeah, bougie, yeah. bougie adorable, but, um, sideways, you are definitely I, the connection person for up there though. Sideways I've stayed at twice and I love it. It's right off the freeway in Buellton. Um, it's a remodeled, it's so owned by the same people who own the Vinland and the Winston in Solvang. Um, and it's just, it's a really, the rooms are great and, you know, it's, it's an affordable option up in the area. So I can reach out and see what kind of rate we can get and see, you know, if that would be an option for those that don't want to necessarily drive up and back in one day. Yeah. And then this is also something that of course we would open up to, this is not a closed loop invitation. This is please bring your friends, um, family, whoever will make it kid friendly. I think all the wineries are happy to have children. Um, I know that there are of course COVID restrictions, so we'll have to finagle that. So we will probably ask for a, a final head count of course prior, but we will, we will make it accessible to everyone as much as we possibly can. Do you know, the only thing we have to be careful about is harvest has started. So winery visits can be a little challenging. Yes. I think we can do it. We're special. We got this, Allison. That's true. We are special. <laughs> <laughs> October 9th, will it be starting or will it be like winding down? It'll like, be a mid. No, no, I mean, right? 
if they're picking already, but they'll still be, they'll be in the process because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be up there the next week. Hi, Aiden. <laughs> um, Aiden, you want to come to Santa Barbara with us? Um, I think, um, I know I'll be up the next week and I know that, um, Matt D's already said he'll be in the middle of harvest and picking and stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm thinking Grassini will probably be an opportunity for us. Um, and yeah, there's, there's enough. We will in the next week, um, we'll, there's we'll too probably. many good wineries up there. There's too many. It'll be I like. I could probably Unreal. hook us up to go to the new barn at the Hilt because it just opened. It's a beautiful tasting room. The Hilt yeah. and what's the parent label, Hanada? Oh my yes. God. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Gina and I can talk about our ideas and see what we can do. Yeah. I'm super excited for it. I'm, I'm like <laughs> going to tell everybody this is amazing. This is going to be fun. Yeah, it will be fun. We'll, we'll make it, we'll make it a blast. And, um, this is not a, a for-profit situation. We just are happy to have an experience with you guys. So whatever the ticket price is literally is just tasting and I'm, we'll hook up a, a lunch. We'll figure out a, probably Panino because that's always my go-to up in at least the Los Olivos area. Um, or we could maybe do like industrial eats or something like that. Take out because actually um, industrial eats. Um, I could hook us up to go up to um, Piazza Vineyard with Gretchen up at Yes, absolutely. We have to do that. That's a really, that would and be Piazza and Luna Hart. And then also James Sparks, I could get us over to Liquid Farm. He'll meet up with us. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> and he's over in, in Lompoc and there's an eye on eye, which is the new industrial eats second location right over there yeah. industrial eats is so ridiculously good there's oh also a gosh. great little there's a new wine bar in solving called wine uh clean slate wine that is great with they carry my wine. <laughs> do they <laughs> yeah. well they used to anyways i think they sold through it but uh jason is the owner and he's fantastic super nice uh, yeah i like him um and you know there's zaka creek for food or the Vaquero bar in Solving, like Solving's coming alive. So Solving is perking up in the hipster land. It is no longer your windmill Danish kitschy place. I mean, be real, it still is, but it's Definitely just going to become super is. kitschy and hipstery, right? Like, well, like... the kitschy is still there, but the hipster has moved in and is taking, there are some really good restaurants that have opened up there. Um, yeah, it's... People wearing t-shirts that just say like, fuck your windmill with a big windmill on it. <laughs> like... Is that real? That's so so hipster. No, I'm just joking. No, I <laughs> you have like... Hurt. You have Peasant's Feast that has that really good fried chicken sandwich. And yeah, there's a lot of good yeah, stuff. Yes, I carry my wine. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> Gina, you're everywhere, aren't you? That was like a 30 I'm minute literally in those two You places. need to let these people go. <laughs> um, yes. Well, we're really excited, obviously. And uh, this concludes our island wine tasting. Stay tuned for more information about our next virtual tasting. You will get information via email about um, the backyard tastings that my company is hosting, as well as uh, more information about our in-person tasting as well. Um, I know that we're gonna chat about that when we're off, when everyone's gone this evening, but then also over the next week. So, um, this is really exciting. We're, I feel like we're kind of coming into this next phase where I don't see us phasing out the virtual tastings at all, but being able to infuse an in-person element and getting together um, to really experience wines together will be ultimately probably less expensive, not, not counting travel, but if we're all sharing a couple of bottles, of course, you don't all have to buy your own individual bottles. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm really excited and very hopeful that while COVID is still happening, that we can really get to know each other in a more personal level um, and share these awesome wines outside of the computer screen. So this will be fun, and, you guys. Gina, are we, we are going to revisit um, our next series in like end of October, early November? Yes. Yeah. And um, 
absolutely. I, I don't have specific dates blocked off, but in the last tasting, we all decided we're sticking with Friday at six. That's still a good time for everyone. Um, we'll, we'll manage it. So we'll do a, a, a three to maybe four part series, South America, um, and we will keep it away from the holidays so as not to interfere with anyone's travel and family time because while we you are our wine family but you know it's and we won't we won't interrupt Halloween no we will not because Halloween's on Sunday and you all know my husband a lot less than you know me at this point but he has been talking we've never hosted a Halloween party but he wants to have a a party and so he's a, a Star Wars nerd and he wants to have a Boba Fett so you know if, there you go wordplay and it's, I'm going as a cup of boba tea, Cute. just to piss him off. If anyone understands. I was too that busy right. eating ribs, but I wanted to I need, I need, I need suggestions. I'm going to the Jordan Halloween party, Jordan Winery. And the theme this year is, is aliens and extraterrestrials. And I need an idea for a costume. Ooh. Oh my God. Can I go with you, please? <laughs> I'm so lonely and bored. <laughs> We must discuss this later. <laughs> I don't want to beg in front of everybody else. But... Um, Drinking so isosceles, like... vintage isosceles in costume sounds like it might be the no, best no, part of my Justin, year. Not just in Jordan. Oh, okay. Whatever Jordan. Jordan's top, top tier <laughs> wine. I don't even care anymore. Um, but if anyone has suggestions on aliens or extraterrestrial fun costumes, I'm open because I am at a loss. Aaron will help you out. We'll, we'll, okay. send, you, we'll send you an email of, of extraterrestrial. Success. Let's talk about this. I feel <laughs> like you should do something with, from the movie, The Fifth Element. Um, ah. it's really important that you do so. In fact, for my 30th birthday, we did a, a backyard movie screening, like the one that we'll be doing for our Halloween themed tasting. Uh, I, I screened The Fifth Element because that is my childhood. So there's lots of fun costume options uh, in there. I'm, I'm looking quickly. I just don't want body suits, no body suits. That's fair. Well, people are starting to drop and I don't wanna hold anyone else at 7.30. So please uh, feel free to stick on. We'll still be chatting, but if you have to go, happy, happy Friday. Um, we hope to see you all on October 9th. You will, of yeah. course. I, I will not be dressing like that. No, that's <laughs> the costumes. That's that's the go-to, but there's much, far more creative costumes. That's a terrific <laughs> outfit. And I will not be dressed like that. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> because there's too much that'll fall out between the lines. I'm going to dress, dress like that. Show me that again. You should, Mike. I'm so dressing like that. <laughs> Yeah, so. <laughs> Karen says, less port and more Madeira in my future. All right. We did so, it. So I just have to ask, is everyone, can, does everyone like Madeira? Has this opened your eyes to something you didn't know or did you kind of already know that Madeira was good? You can off mute or you can comment. I see uh, all watching we the have never had Madeira before and <laughs> never heard of it, to be honest, until I had heard of Madeira just from a Real Housewives episode when they went there. <laughs> but that's really it. Um, and they talked about how strong the wine was and the puncha. So I was like, yes, I heard about that. Um, <laughs> I like the dry. The dry one was really good with the sushi, actually. The albacore yeah. was pretty good with it. And some of the spiciness, I felt like really balanced out well together. It was on the scale of sweetness, yeah. a little sweeter than I normally would gravitate towards, but it was it was interesting. And I would order if I saw it on the menu again, but I probably would need that tasting. I think that really kind of brought it out for me. Yeah, I, I will say that when I see it on a menu, I've usually had it with my dessert or for my dessert. So if I'm gonna have like, I'll have Madeira and maybe like some chocolates or um, some nuts or cheese, like a cheese plate of Madeira, and I'm perfectly happy. I'm not saying you have to take Madeira through your whole meal. I'm just saying you can take Madeira through your whole meal. <laughs> yeah, and in very small portions because yeah. this level of sweetness is, it's a lot, um, it's a lot, unless that's- really I mean, 
I, I just ripped through like two bottles. But the, but what she said, that's very interesting, the sushi. I mean, I am I am actually really curious to try that pairing at some point. I hope I get the opportunity. I feel like when I go to a sushi place, they're not going to have Madeira of any yeah. quality on their list. And we're not so talking would, about the sweetness as much that's so cooling. <clears throat> if you have the right pairing, the acidity will definitely be the thing. It's having 22% alcohol through a whole meal is is... I mean, for me, Allison, you just gave my cheat sheet on desserts, which is <laughs> skip the desserts and go cheese plate and then a, yeah. you know, what people consider a sweet wine, but something of high acid like a Madeira and right. then maybe a coffee at the end and like everybody <laughs> else can gorge on the like sugar cake and it's like the, the chocolate. So yeah. Yeah. I was at um, Villette in Sonoma in Healdsburg. Mm. They have Madeira on the menu. And a friend of mine just had dinner there the other night who lives up there and she posted yum Madeira on Instagram. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so jealous. I love Madeira. And she goes, I had Madeira because the last time I was there was with you and you ordered Madeira. And now it has me <laughs> ordering Madeira for dessert. I'm like, good. <laughs> so, but I would, I would encourage, assuming you didn't finish all your bottles, except for Mike. Um, <laughs> You know, try some of the recipes that Gina shared. Um, the pasta with the shrimp dish was really good with the cerciol. I'm gonna do the sauteed mushrooms because I prepped everything and then I'll just eat the rest of it tomorrow. But, you know, a simple dish of, um, I had Googled um, sauteed mushrooms with Madeira as opposed to just making regular ones. So thought I'd play with that and, you know, cheeses like try different cheeses and so you're saying you have madeira left still i'm gonna uber over i'll see you in a few minutes. also yeah. if anyone has anyone seen i'll be right there the great british baking show does anyone watch that on netflix oh totally yeah so they the madeira cake recipe that i included um mm. to go with the dry madeira um that was featured on one of the episodes, one of their cake episodes. So they made a Madeira cake. So you can follow along with one of the recipes from that show. So much fun. Yeah. Um, Natalie, did it work with the cheddar cheese? Uh, yeah, we we liked it with the, the Cerciol. It worked better with that one. Yeah, I would say if you're gonna do cheese, getting something with a little more creamy texture, a little more weight um, than just a hard cheese yeah. will work better with the, the, the kind of sweetness of the boil. Um, going with the harder cheeses, you wanna go more with the Verdeo or the Cerciol. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, that's a fun thing about trying different things and seeing what kind of works or works better. I mean, everything can work, but something might do better. So yeah, I really liked the Madeira. I had never had it before. And it was strange because I, I didn't really like the Bual one at first. And then after trying the Cerciol, I, I I don't know, I ended up liking it a lot better. <laughs> so I don't know. No, <laughs> I, I get, get the, fir the first sip, you know, when you're not used to it, the first sip can be off-putting because it's either higher acidity or more alcohol or sweeter or a combination. It, it's not what you're used to in anything. And then when you realize how long the flavor lingers and how that acidity just carries on, and then you realize your mouth is watering for more, you're like, oh, wait, let me try another sip. And each sip gets a little more like, ooh, I like this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. That if you don't, if you're not planning on drinking all of this yourself, I included in that email um, a number of, there's a link for um, Madeira cocktails. So you can use this as a mixer too, if you don't just like it by itself or haven't found a food to a food item to pair it with. Um, there's a lot of cocktails, rest, cocktail recipes that you can find online. And you can treat this just as like a, like a triple sec or in like a margarita, not, I'm not saying use this in a margarita, but you know, those different like mixers, like a vermouth yeah. or something like that. There's a ton of really cool sounding cocktails that you can make with these if you have leftovers and you're a cocktail fan. And because they'll last in the fridge forever, I just think these are the most versatile wines in terms of food that I've probably, that we've Mike. probably ever had on the show. Mike. 
Forget right? the refrigerator. You can leave this on top of your refrigerator. <laughs> That's and let ridiculous. It you will not kill this thing. You can go take it outside, put it on your dashboard of your car in the summer heat. You and will next not year, kill it. <laughs> and next year, pair it with whatever you wanted. It's like literally invincible and it, it pairs with everything. I'm fascinated. I might be the only person of the group that preferred the Bual a little bit more than the Strasil. I enjoyed them both so much, but really like, cool. yeah, to me, there's a little more complexity, if a little I'm, more depth, if I'm and a little go more sit on, the finish. If I'm going to go sit on my couch right now and watch TV, I want the Cersei, I want the Bual. The Bual, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. If I'm just going to, pairing with food and, I mean, don't get me wrong, with my cheese, I want the Bual, but with other dishes, I would love the Cersei all with other dishes but if i'm just gonna sip and have like a dessert wine or have an after dinner drink yeah and even is, the word the the phrase dessert wine with these wines bothers me it's just <laughs> i just don't want to categorize it as a dessert wine but well, that's just I'm my power personally this bottle that you may not have finished you can just have a little bit every night or once a month no, i no. mean what's I'm, gonna I'm happen i'm pairing it with pepperoni pizza like we talked about what's gonna happen is um the acidity will maintain and the sugar can get more intense mm -hmm. like a momsy but, but um i mean my god i think if i go into my parents bar mm -hmm. i think there's a madeira that was my grandparents yes. of all the liquor that was when shall i meet when shall i meet because <laughs> i've been dying liquor, to meet parents <laughs> oh i mean i was finding i found like a chocolate mint liqueur and i was like mom i don't think you can still have this in your bar um but you know, the one thing I have yes. faith in is that Madeira. The Madeira is the only thing that I have faith that if I found it in some grandparents' bar, I'd be like, oh, that's that's okay. Everything else I'd be like, I just don't think it should have lasted 50 years. Like it just doesn't seem right. Well, no, unless it's chartreuse. If it's chartreuse, you have gold on your hands. You know that, right? Yeah. But but the but yeah, I mean, I did I think I got through the whole thing without saying. I know everybody needs to go. For me, the comparison is going to be a sherry because I drink a fair amount of sherry. And and these are just very interesting. And for the price point, I'm going to be seeking out more Madeira. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm looking up chartreuse. What's chartreuse? My God. I, anybody who wants to go should go. It's, yes, I have to put kids If you to bed, really want to hear me all. tell this Gina so about this, this is made with hundreds us. of different. Okay, bye, you guys. Gina, chartreuse is made from hundreds of different. Yes, but that is one of the only spirits that ages. Like officially, technically, it, it ages in bottle, which is super weird and super different, and it does. And in San Francisco, there's two places that specialize in it. One's called the Saratoga. And the other is called, I can't remember, but it's awesome. And there's a few other, you know, hipstery sort of bars that understand that chartreuse that has bottle age on is a thing. And bye, you guys. And it, and it really is. It's just, it's just like I've had some of these older bottles of chartreuse and they can be a little hipstery and spendy and stuff, but oh my God. Like if you ever come across some at a state sale or at a you know, whatever, just take a chance and buy it. And it like, like potentially it could be amazing. Um, as it is chartreuse that we went, if we went to Total Wine today and bought a chartreuse, you know, you might find it to be a lot sweeter than a sweet Madeira. Like it will come across as actually legitimately quite sweet, even to my palate. But as it ages in bottle, it gets higher acid and gets all the herbal, bizarre herbal components because monks make it and they use hundreds of different herbs. They have different recipes and it just is a thing. It is so, I don't want to cuss, but it's so effing phenomenal to your palate, if, especially if you have the sort of palate that's attracted to things like Madeira, high minerality, Chablis, you know, like Encruzado, these sort of things that we talk about all the time, these sort of funky mineral driven Jura, you know, if you like these sort of things, then uh, aged chartreuse is a thing. Even, even non-aged chartreuse is a, is a thing if you see out the premium stuff, but yeah. If you just go to a straight up bar, I uh, Katie, that's Katie, what I should do. I should Sorry, find Mike. good chartreuse to bring to the live tasting. That's what I should do. Do it. Katie, where are you guys off to? We are going to Cabo. 
Nice. I'm going there next week. When are you going to be there? We're going to be there through Tuesday. We're not going to Cabo San Lucas. We're going to the other Cabo. Okay. We'll miss you. San Jose, San Jose Del Cabo. It's gorgeous there. I was there in November. It's really, really beautiful. I'm excited. I've never been. So be safe. Yeah, need be a little safe. vacay. Yes. <laughs> I know. I'll see you I all just, soon in person. I just, I just went and had my COVID test today because I'm flying out Sunday. Woo! Fun. Thanks, right. Katie. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks. Marcy is still here. Marcy, I can just say I really enjoyed your story. I would love to listen to you <laughs> tell more stories in the future. That was like the highlight of my week. I, I have, oh, you know what I always say to people is I have a story for everything because I'll be explaining something even at work. And then like this digression comes along or I have a story for everything, but yeah, that was, that was a while. Yeah. But unlike most people, your story was actually super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> like I have a story for everything, but it would just make people want to strangle me. <laughs> your story was actually kind of crazy and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some, some, someday I'll have to, uh, you know, if I have this, I only had, I had two ounces of each of them. That's how much I drank of this stuff. That's how powerful it is. It's yeah. tasty stuff. Yeah. I'm on my third, I poured like this much of each, but I've now revisited this much like five times and I have not eaten dinner yet. So it's time soon for sure. Uh almost half a bottle left like what's the problem but you started last night right you said you opened those up last night i so did i, I was like i was like yeah, what have i, I been opened, waiting for yeah i opened i opened the bual last night but i only had i drank from my little glasses that are a little um i think they're one ounce glasses they're really little yeah i know it the little like cocktail yeah drink. these little little tiny you know red and those white are, glasses those are the worst. You need to pour them in a big, the same amount, but in a big glass. And then yeah. you can take yeah. squirrel on it. It the was, it was one, and, and, and I did, my mother used to drink sherry. And yeah. uh, that was about the only thing that she drank. And so as soon as I tasted it, that was, I was like, I had this flashback and could see my mother like sitting on her, you know, the couch with her little glass. But I didn't, I had a, a couple, maybe three of those glasses last night. I slept pretty well. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go make the mushrooms. I'm going to clean up everything. I'm going to sit on my couch and sip a little of this ball while I watch a little TV, pass out, and tomorrow morning wake up, work out, pack, because I haven't packed yet. And uh, yeah, Allison, just before you leave, can yeah, you? No, I'm not in a rush now. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't, I don't want to keep you because you do have a lot. You're going to Italy. I would be no, so you, but you are, you are still recording. Just so oh, yeah. Yeah. you want to stop recording. <laughs> I always forget. Thank you. And actually, here we go.